Hello and welcome to My Security TV. My name's Chris Cubbage and we're at Security 2011 Conference and Exhibition in Sydney. I'm joined by Professor Rick Saar from the University of South Australia. Rick, thanks very much for coming. My pleasure, Chris. Rick, you recently uh, published Australian Research Council study, uh, A New Era in Plural Policing, uh, co-authored with uh, Professor Tim Prenzler. Could you tell us a little bit about the study and how the importance of this type of work? Tim and I have been looking at the security industry for a decade and we thought 10 years ago that it was worth exploring for a whole range of reasons. One, because people were always talking about policing in terms of our state police forces as if they were the only people doing security and policing work in Australia. We knew that wasn't the case, but we had no way of benchmarking just how big the industry was, what its powers and immunities were, whether in fact the partnerships were working, and what health and safety issues there were for security officers. We saw many security officers being injured and thought it was time for us to make a comprehensive benchmark study. There'd been one like that in the States, United States, about 25 years ago, and we thought the only way you can begin to analyse and compare this particular security industry is by having a benchmarking study. So this is the foundation for a lot more work. And as you said, uh, the industry always suspected that it was much larger than uh, law enforcement had been. Uh, and some of the statistics was uh, with a population increase of about 14%. Uh, law enforcement had increased only about 11%. Oh, a little bit more than that. Uh, 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 maybe, I think, in the 17 or 18s, but certainly security had increased in terms of full-time security people over that period by about 40%. 40%. So it's quite, two or three a, times more than the population. That's right. And it's a significant growth uh, in, during that period. Well, I think everyone's seen that significant growth. People were saying, well, I'd like to be secure. For a fairly cheap price, I can get people who can work for me rather than call the police if something goes wrong with a reaction time of 15 or 20 minutes, which is usually a lot too late if you're uh, worried about a burglar or an assault. So clearly the industry met a demand. It was prepared to do that. People were prepared to pay for it, and over the last three decades, we've seen a massive growth in the security industry. And the implications uh, in relation to how the industry operates, uh, going through a massive growth uh, in a relatively short period of time, uh, what were some of the outcomes from the study that you saw uh, still room for improvement, or still offer room for improvement? Well, my own interest is, is looking at legal powers and legal immunities, and clearly the law has simply not kept up, kept up with this growth. And so I've been making a number of recommendations about how better we could pass a little bit of legislation, not wholesale legislation, just to clarify when those immunities might kick in and what powers certain trained security officers may have in order to smooth over some of the cracks in relation to those legal immunities and powers. The other issue, of course, is around regulation. That's really the big one where a lot of the work is being done. Why is it being done or why does it need to be done? Because there's always been this sense that police are highly accountable, which of course is a little dubious in itself, but the security people were just cowboys and had no accountabilities at all. So governments uh, have been addressing that over the last 15 years. We now have accountability recognition, certainly in terms of licensing, plus a whole range of other accountabilities which we in the study want to examine. And I, I suppose uh, from my perspective, uh, from someone within the industry, uh, as a consultant and investigator, I have to uh, get up to 16 different licences to operate nationally. Can you explain uh, the types of changes and where we still need to go? One of the great dilemmas, of course, is when you've got states and different jurisdictions doing their own thing, as they have, things tend to grow like topsy. So every state, we might remember the old railways fiasco, the consumer credit fiasco, the insurance fiasco. Doing your own thing, another one, defamation, doing your own thing is fine, but when all of a sudden the Australian polity becomes you know, one country, it does create some rather burdensome uh, difficulties and dilemmas for people who want to move through the states. And ultimately, we'd like to make sure there's some sort of uniform national code about training, about registered training organisations, about curriculum and about licensing so people don't have to go through a cumbersome, inefficient uh, licensing regime in order to operate in this country. Rick, the study identified uh, a range of changes over the last 15 years within the industry. Could you explain what the study identified in terms of legislation and uh, the priorities of COAG? COAG, at the very least, made an effort to say if we are going to have a uniform approach, let's put down some, some guidelines. Guidelines to do with uh, history checks, guidelines to do with fingerprinting, guidelines to do with people explaining their absences, for example, if they've been out of Australia for the last 12 months and can't explain the absences. So they set down those guidelines. We made a number of other suggestions about how best to streamline that process. And of course, the COAG guidelines were only related to man guarding. They weren't looking at electronic sector or other sectors as well. So 
we're suggesting COAG has gone and created a nice platform, but it should be built upon now. And again, they were simply looking at from a regulatory point yes. of view, so how to control the industry rather than how to benefit and how to get the maximum input for, for what I consider a critical industry. Well, that's true, although they did make a number of recommendations concerning uh, training, curriculum, uh, minimum hours that a person might have to be in certain license categories in order to qualify. And of course COAG were very concerned about the fact that so many private security operatives are now being embraced enthusiastically in terms of national infrastructure. If that's the case then you've got to make sure the people who are working for the protection and security of national infrastructure can, can pass all the probity checks. So they were very concerned about that and that's been a good move and most states have moved fairly well in relation to a number of those COAG requirements. But as far as we can see, the national approach that they were looking for across the dozen or so areas that they wanted to make a national approach uh, has not occurred and we'd like to redouble our efforts, or at least challenge COAG, to make those states' reports that much more immediate and cogent in relation to the benchmarks that have been set. Do you think there is still going to be a continued delay in getting all of this back in front of COAG uh, to be readdressed? Yeah, well I suppose that's a political question, isn't it? COAG of course have got a whole range of things they'd like to do. This is obviously seen as not one of the more urgent ones, which of course makes no sense at all. If you're looking at Australia's national security, I couldn't think of anything more important than making, than making the states get this particular issue right. A nice little parallel is that we had this dog's breakfast of defamation laws. Attorney General then, uh, Philip Ruddock, knocked all the attorneys general's heads together and said let's come up with a national uniform framework. It took two or three years but we got it with national uniform code of defamation. We should be doing that with licensing as well. At the moment there are three different sorts of models of licensing across the eight jurisdictions. That should never be the case and we'd like to think there could be at least one model, namely do you have an administrative unit or a police dominated unit or a police controlled unit at least if we could get that right, then I would have thought the rest of it would fall into place fairly easily. The study used the term plural policing. Could you define uh, and explain that particular term to us? Plural policing is a term that's been developed over the last decade to explain the fact that if we were to ask ourselves what keeps us safe and secure, it's not really police. I mean, there's only 45,000 police officers in this country. Clearly, our safety and security is is, is, is born out of a whole range of things. Uh, the way in which we uh, secure our own homes, the way in which we secure our businesses, the way in which we have locksmiths who are looking after things, the way in which we have community development that uh, leads to you know, no riots, for example, plus you've got police, plus you've got more than 100,000 people who wear security badges on a weekly basis. So plural policing is recognising that if we're looking at safety, security, harmony, and the feeling of goodwill in any particular country, we have to recognise all of the factors that go into making us safe and to simply put our eyes on police officers or the AFP uh, is simply to delude ourselves into thinking that they are the key to our success, the key to our security. That's simply not the case. So a plurality basically is saying there's lots of things that keep us secure and into that particular mix come the whole gamut, the whole variety of the security industries that we enjoy today. There are a number of examples of police and uh, the security industry working together. One is South Australia, uh, the Project Griffin. Uh, did you identify other uh, examples of police and, and security industry working together? The study didn't do a randomised study, didn't say let's go out and look at a whole range of cooperative endeavours and test which ones are or not working. We make no uh, apologies for the fact that we chose a dozen really good cooperation models to examine to see what it was about those models that actually worked very well. And we took one from each jurisdiction and doubled up in some jurisdictions. You're quite right, the Project Griffin approach in South Australia works very well. Uh, there are some other wonderful um, cooperative endeavours uh, around uh, Market City here in Sydney, for example, an Ipswich program, for example, Eyes on the Street in Western Australia, Qantas Security, etc., where public and private mix together and do extremely well. What we're trying to do is to say that if the government, or indeed the populace, has any uh, difficulty in embracing private options as part of that plurality, part of that mix, they can simply go to those particular case studies to see that they can actually work if the sort of trust, cooperation and communication that's required is working on a daily basis. In other words, it can work if you get your regulatory structures right, if you get your training structures right, and if you get your public confidence right. And the security industries around this country ought to be applauded for making a great professionalism drive to ensure that that's given the best opportunity. Well, on that note, you've looked at uh, policing and security uh, in other 
uh, areas of the world as well. How would you rate Australian, the Australian industry uh, following this study? I won't say that I've tried to give a qualitative assessment. I can say, of course, that Australia is not alone in this. Uh, there are some interesting areas of the world. Uh, I'm about to go to Korea to have a look at their, uh, their area, which they maintain is a fabulous one. I've just been in Japan a couple of weeks ago, and they have a strong private security sector working cooperatively with, with police. Um, certainly, a lot of people in Eastern Europe are telling me how fast they're growing, and essentially, most of their, most of their personnel are coming out of the old kind of state Stasi type of yep. uh, police organisations in the, in the, in the pre-Soviet era. Uh, and of course they've got some clues about certain things. I'm, I, I'm not guaranteeing that they've got clues about everything, but certainly they are growing extremely strongly in the eastern, in the eastern countries or the old former eastern bloc countries. Um, I would say that the trend we see in Australia here is a trend that's being mirrored around the world. What we can say in Australia is that we've got a very, very solid model and one, one of the reasons that our study is being uh, examined around the world is because we've actually set down a benchmark that we and the Americans are probably the only two countries that have done it now and the other countries are now saying wouldn't it be nice to have a benchmark study of our own that we can then compare and contrast as the years roll out. Rick thanks for coming on uh, as a former police officer of 14 years and uh, now been in the industry for about six uh, this type of work uh, really is a benchmark it sets uh, an example I think as you say uh, this work has only been done in the US and now Australia, uh, so congratulations on an excellent report and uh, we'll certainly be promoting that uh, across our brands. Thanks very much. My pleasure, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank you.